Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Uh, thanks also to the organizers. I think uh, you managed to put together a beautiful event. It's really exciting to have such a diverse range of approaches to love. So I have been honestly enjoying that the whole day already. So thank you. Uh, my paper will actually, so there's not a lot of feminist philosophy in that paper, but it is on Julia Kristeva, who is usually considered a feminist philosopher, but not only. Uh, the topic of my paper is actually a book, namely Julia Kristeva's 600 page volume uh, on Teresa of Avila. So I will, I have uh, two parts. I will talk about that uh, later briefly. Kristeva has written actually a lot about love and a lot about religion, starting already in with her 1983 uh, volume, Histoire d'Amour. Uh, my paper now will focus on a special uh, aspect of her interest in love, namely on Christian mysticism. Her 2008 novel, I put this under quotation mark, Teresa, my love, an imagined life of the saint of Avila, uh, which was translated into English in 2015, is a love declaration from Kristeva to Teresa. The main protagonist of the text, uh, the French psychoanalyst and academic Sylvia Leclerc, which is a disguised version of Kristeva, becomes obsessed with the writings of uh, Teresa of Avila and embarks on a trip to Spain so as to reconstruct Teresa's lives and thoughts. Although labeled uh, a novel, the text is a, a combination of various genres. Close readings of Teresa's texts and narratives about her life, accounts of Sylvia's life in Paris and her trip to Spain, including lengthy email correspondences, technical elaborations of very specific psychoanalytic problems and issues, a four act play with Leibniz, Spinoza and God himself as protagonists, and a letter from Sylvia to Denise Diderot. As one reviewer put it, this text creates a thoroughly disorienting experience for the reader. And I can confirm that it is a very disorienting text in a way. Uh, quoting extensively from Teresa's writings and drawing from the autobiographical text as well as her letters and her poetry, Kristeva's what I would call intertextual approach connects now the vastly different time period, so the 16th century and our time, and the vastly different life contexts by interrelating various experiences and expressions of love. The first part of my paper will uh, investigate Kristeva's understanding of love. And the second part will attempt to, uh, by focusing more on issues of language and writing, will locate her text on uh, Teresa within the broader context of uh, Kristeva's concept of intimate revolt. But first to uh, Kristeva's understanding of love as she develops it in this text. I called it Teresa, my love from mysticism and psychoanalysis. The narrative skeleton of Chris Davis' book is made up of the biographical facts of Teresa of Avila's life, starting of her childhood, her entry into the Carmelite order, her years of suffering from bodily ailments, her rise as a writer, her conflict with the order and with the Inquisition, her role as foundress of numerous uh, convents all the way to her death. So that's the kind of plot line. These biogra biographical facts are conveyed partly through Teresa's own texts, partly through a contemporary psychoanaly a psychoanalytic reading of those texts by Sylvia Leclerc, which is, as I said already, this made up alter ego for uh, Christeva. Thus, the double case of mysticism and psychoanalysis are there from the beginning. And I quote, there is no denying the affinities between mysticism and psychoanalysis, so Chris Taylor. Uh, with love serving as one of the main connecting links between the two. 
for Kristeva using Kristeva as uh, sorry for Kristeva using Teresa as her lead, but also her love object. Love signifies a partial boundary breakdown, while at the same time a distancing and a, and a separation. So that pattern, that's very important because that goes through the entire book and is crucial, I think, for Chris Davis' understanding of love. Love assures that the merging of different beings or different states into one does not lead into uh, an abyss of dissolution or a traumatic experience that ends in psychosis. If cast within a loving context, separation becomes an accepted necessity that enables the subject to gain access to the law and thus to language. In other words, love is to soften the experience of separation without eliminating uh, becoming one with the beloved object. And underlying all this is a broader basic outlook of Kristeva that I should mention, namely her, like, consequent consistent critique of the concept of identity be it with respect to the subject or be it with respect to as meaning is constructed in language and thus it's always this double yes there is a merger there is a blending but always with this twist of like in the context of a separation but the blending the love that is uh produced there makes the separation bearable so this uh, pattern that is made possible through love can be seen in a variety of ways in the text. For example, in Teresa's love for God as a, dis a dissolution of her self-identity, there's always this you are in me, I am in you, you are me, I am you. Uh, while at the same time, she's also experiencing a distancing that enables her to write. If there wouldn't be the distance, she couldn't write about what she's experiencing. I'm claiming. Uh, it is further seen in a breakdown between inside and outside, uh, with bodily states being the markers of uh, Teresa's inner life. It is further seen in Teresa's engagement with the affairs of the world. So she is not caught in her interior castle. She moves off outside eventually and changes the world uh, through her uh, reform of the order. But similarly, Chris Davis' description of the psychoanalytic transference countertransference process also assumes a temporary dissolution of self boundaries, thus indicating a form of love between the analyst and the analysis, with the separation reinstated after the transference countertransference process is completed. And lastly, there is Chris Davis' love for Teresa that, that manifests itself, itself in the merging of texts. That's what I'm claiming. Christeva's reading, quoting, interpreting, and rephrasing uh, of Teresa's rich corpus of writing produces yet a new text that makes it difficult, but not impossible, to draw the line between what's Teresa's words and what's Christeva's words. The common uh, ground that Chris Deva establishes on the, the common thematic ground uh, between psychoanalysis and mysticism centers around the role of the father and the proximity between body and language. So that's the thematic focus, but the pattern I described goes through all of it. First to the role of the father. The constellation of a loving father who sacrifices his son, turning this sacrifice into a gift, the transformation or sublimation of bodily desires into something spiritual, mental, lastly into language, into language. The importance of the word and its connection to the flesh. All these main building blocks of Christian faith allow Chris David to insert her psychoanalytic toolkit, so to speak, to untangle and re the various lines of attraction and devotion, repetition and displacement of immanence and transcendence. Uh, she brings this affinity between her, the affinity that she claims between Christianity and psychoanalysis uh, further into focus by rewriting the role of the father, 
within the context of traditional psychoanalytic theory. And this is now something she also attributes to Teresa. So what Kristeva does with the father role in psychoanalytic theory, Kristeva claims Teresa is doing with God. As for Kristeva, she replaces Lacan's threatening, castrating father by introducing an imaginary loving father, making use of Freud's notion of the father in individual prehistory. And this loving father is one who intervenes at the point of the child's separation from the mother's body thus before the onset of the edible crisis. This assumption of, the pre, of a pre-edible loving father is a further elaboration of Kristeva's notion of the semiotic, a pre-linguistic space bound to the body of the mother, which makes future signification possible. Inventing a loving father counteracts the dominance of the mother's body during this pre-linguistic period. This archaic, she calls him, loving father, a combination of the maternal and the paternal, uh, Kristeva actually calls it the father-mother conglomerate. This imaginary father now provides love and support for the child during the process of separation from the body of the mother, thereby paving the way for its entry into the symbolic order. This loving third prepares the rocky, the subject's rocky transition from narcissism and autoeroticism to the edible conflict and thus into language. So Kristeva does not start the onset of language with the uh, edible crisis, but before. That is her notion of the semiotic. She says the separation of the child from the mother's body pre prepares it already in form of pre-linguistic kind of rhythms of the body for what's to come. But that is only possible if we assume this loving father. If that is not the place, something goes wrong and it becomes pathological. Now, Kristeva notes a similar rewriting of the father, or of the father figure in Teresa, in her, in her case, it is called the father. Oh, yeah. And I quote now from the very book. Teresa rewrote the thousand year old story of God the Father. In her visions, through her pen, the tyrannical beloved, the stern father, softens into a father so tender as to become an ideal alter ego, kind and rewarding, which draws the ego out of it itself, ecstatic. He is in her. He is her and she is him, as she is him, sorry, end of quote. Teresa originally conflicted about her relationship to God, feeling unworthy of his love, full of guilt and self-doubt and bedridden with numerous ailments, realized that she desired an ideal loving father if she were to overcome her masochistic destructive forces. And she needs to overcome those in order to serve her community. She needed to leave the original father figure behind and replace him with an imaginary father. And I quote again from Kristeva, the ideal father is the fantasy, a gendered representation that rises above sexuality. He is a father and so a progenitor, but ideal because defined by his symbolic function a crossroad figure that stands between desire and meaning, between passion and thought, end of quote. So she invents, Kristeva is claiming, Teresa invents this father to get the link in a way between pure desire that uh, should be translated into meaning or pure passion that should be captured in th uh, some form of rationality. Whereby for Kristeva, one has to add, fantasy is not opposed to reason. And I quote again, fantasies think like dreams think. And their thinking uncovers emotional truths that are opaque to reason, end of quote. So Teresa as well as Kristeva rewrite the function of the father 
in terms of an imaginary being who offers love, support, and protection, thereby opening a metonymic chain from God to actual father, to Freud, Lacan, to the role of the father in psychoanalysis, all the way to the place of the analyst. This rewriting of the father position assures a smooth transition into the symbolic realm by bringing the body into language rather than leaving it behind. And that is what I claim the second thematic focus uh, in Chris Davis uh, analogy between mysticism and psychoanalysis. And I quote again, that's Chris Davis now, and the word was made flesh. So obviously quoting John here, she talking about Kristeva, uh, about uh, Teresa. She rediscovers willy nilly how intrinsic to the human condition is the capacity for representation, sublimation, idealization, and how perpetually under threat. End of quote. Entering the symbolic order is not facilitated through the threat of castration or the threat of hell, for that matter. It is not about feeling a lack, but rather, in Christeva's account, reading Teresa, the word always has been flesh. The flesh always had meaning, but it requires loving support to give these rudimentary meaning configurations of individual prehistory the right direction. Love cannot be pure merger. The child has to separate from the mother's body. Teresa has to realize that her writing is only possible if she allows her ecstasies of bodily unity with the beloved to be interrupted by already established linguistic codes. And I quote again from Kristeva, talking now to Teresa, she often talks directly to her in the text, you rose to a grandiose sublimation. Few have ever achieved so complete a convergence of regression and reason, end of quote. Teresa's love of God, as well as the imaginary loving father of individual prehistory in psychoanalysis, both exercise their love in terms of a refusal of an absolute merger. The loving relationship is one of chaussance as well as pain, of gaining autonomy and independence through suffering. Those are not mutually exclusive. The loving father God paves the way for the entry into the law, and that means for Christeva always into the symbolic order, and for Teresa back into the world, while at the same time maintaining the intensity of the loving relationship, which actually seemingly undercuts the law, the symbolic order, the demands of the world. So again, it's this interplay between being absorbed in a relationship, but stepping outside, creating a distance, so as to be able to speak, to write, and to uh, get involved in the world. But not only is the loving Christian God who sacrifices his son mirrored in the early process of subject formation within psychoanalytic uh, theory. According to Chris David, the psychoanalytic process, now the clinical process itself is a form of loving merger and subsequent separation. If the goal in the process of transference and countertransference is for the analyst to interpret and to give meaning, he, she can do so only if motivated by love. And I quote again, we psychoanalysts call it transference. Lover melts into love and loved into lover. You know all about that, Teresa. Listening lovingly, a response known as counter transference. The therapist in love with her patient embarks on it because only thus can she pick up the other's truth before disengaging again from this counter transferential love. It is this loving attitude of the analyst which allows Kristeva to approach Christian love in terms of idolization and sublimation, so as to overcome the destructive tendencies of the death drive of masochism and of pain. In Kristeva's view, Teresa's mysticism is already anticipated in her analysis of Christian love in God is love. So 
uh, I skip over that. It's just saying that she wrote about that actually already about the theme in Histoire d'Amour in back in 83. Teresa and uh, Teresa's texts amplify on several levels Chris Davis' psychoanalytic reading of Christianity, taking the loving father as lover, thus reciprocating the love and accepting his gift, the prominent role the body plays for the experience of his loving of this loving relationship with God, the equation of flesh and word with flesh becoming word and words signifying signifying through the flesh. Teresa's attempts to self-analyze and turning her interior castle into the space for an analytic process with herself. And Teresa's various forms of sublimation by turning the masochistic suffering during her early years into a form of jouissance and a form of act active engagement in the world. So that is the end of the first part. How am I doing time-wise? Can I have, how many more minutes do I have? So we have more, more and less five minutes. Okay. Then the second part, I try to wrap that up. What I'm trying to do there is now, that is not explicitly as such in Kristeva, but I'm claiming that uh, Teresa is an exemplary figure for what Kristeva meant by intimate revolt and thus turning love into a facet of revolt in Kristeva's sense. Kristeva's fascination with and love for Teresa thus gains a political dimension if placed within the broader context of a notion of intimate revolt. Teresa can be read as a figure of revolt. Her relationship to God, her lover, the writings of her body, the trials and tribulations of her interior castle, her willingness to change the world, all this can be taken as part of Kristeva's answer to the contemporary crisis of meaning in what she labeled the society of the spectacle, spectacle taking uh, Guy de Boer's phrase or title of the book. Teresa is not just a 16th century nun and mystic. Rather, as Sylvia Leclerc warned us in the text, might she be also our contemporary? And that's where Kristeva takes her as a contemporary. Uh, so she doesn't, she kind of plans the time periods. Uh, how can she be our contemporary? Well, the ailments inflicting her body certainly are contemporary, especially for women. Anorexia, fatigue, insomnia, epilepsy, paralysis, strange bleedings. All this sounds rather familiar. So is Teresa's desire for an all-encompassing transcendent love, a love that goes beyond this world, that empowers her to change this world. This combination of a yearning for transcendence, for going beyond, while at the same time being concerned about life on this earth is not particularly indicative for the 16th century. Nor is Teresa's willingness to self-analyze. So this concern about my own psyche is actually very modern, I would say, as it unfolds in, Chris, in Teresa's texts and furthermore, writing down her experiences. So the ruptures and ecstasies or the events of her daily life, she writes about them. She thinks about them. They are very important for her. Uh, so as Chris Deva put it, your texts can and must be read today and for centuries to come. So Teresa's texts must be read today and in the future. Now, briefly about Chris Davis concept of inter intimate revolt, if you're not familiar with that, it rests on the importance of the psychic life as a resource of resistance against what she calls the uh, culture of the spectacle or the culture of the image of commodification of the market, you name it. Uh, in this deterioration, as she sees it, of cultural life, revolt is not really the old concept of revolt is not possible anymore. As she asks in one of her revolt books, who can revolt and against what? Submerged as we are in the culture of entertainment, the culture of performance, the culture of the show. 
In Kristeva's view, contemporary culture is reigned by the pleasure principle only, with a focus on immediate superficial satisfaction. This culture of the image and the market renders one's inner psychic life as superfluous. As she states in uh, The New Maladies of the Soul, modern man is losing his soul, but he does not know it. And so, well, Teresa certainly was not in danger of losing her soul. Thus, this is one of the many reasons why Teresa is contemporary for Kristeva and is, uh, I think, can be offered as an answer to the so-called miseries of the society of the spectacle. Furthermore, uh, Kristeva's concept of intimate revolt is a revolt that uses the, one's own individual psyche, thus intimate, uh, to bring about a revolt on the level of representation, on the level of language, also on the level of art of the image that I don't talk about because what's important for Teresa is the text is writing. So it is a revolt on the level of signification and representation. It is a form of revolt that attempts to find choices by representing what cannot be represented within the common currency of the symbolic order, namely the sensuous, the bodily, the unconscious, neurotic, psychotic operations. It is the in intentional disruption of the symbolic through the semiotic. So that's how Kristeva links it to her previous distinction between the semiotic and the symbolic that I've already been talking about. And I quote again, that's now from uh, Chris Davis' revolt book, thought or writing in revolt, attempt to find a representation, a language, a thought, a style, for this confrontation with the unity of law, being, and the self, the bringing to the fore of everything that puts the very possibility of unitary meaning to the test. End of quote. And in that this form of representation entails a collision with the law, a jouissance that brings about its nest, uh, that brings it brings about is necessary accompanied by pain and suffering. Though it's always a collision with something that causes pain. Kristeva called this politics that results from intimate revolt, a politics of permanent conflictuality. And it is my claim now that. Uh, Teresa, if anybody uh, lived the life of permanent conflictuality, I think it was Teresa of Avila, starting with uh, a conflict with her father about entering the order, conflict with herself over her self-destructive forms of autoeroticism, conflicts over her self-acclaimed status as the beloved of God, because originally she thought she's not worth it, conflicts with the church hierarchy over her approach to or over her understanding of religious life and the meaning of the order and conflicts in language over how to express what cannot that easily be expressed so in uh, in analogy the psychoanalytic process itself is a per permanent conflictuality uh characterized by similar tensions uh the the, the psychoanalytic process is uh, always uh, unfolds within this tension of adherence to the law, uh, which are the norms of society versus individual satisfaction, which is not always possible because of that law. So a narrow path has to be found uh, and some maneuvers have to take place in the psychoanalytic process to uh, prevent total pathology, but not to give in totally to the law either. So, and the claim I'm making that I think Chris Davis suggests is that a kind of satisfying solution of these tensions, of this conflictuality, that is an intrinsic part of uh, Chris Davis' notion of intimate revolt is love. It's only if guided by some kind of overreaching love, be it the love of the analyst, in the psychoanalytic process, be it the love of some assumed uh, loving God, as in Teresa, be it the love of a protective uh, and uh, understanding father figure, like early father figure in psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic theory itself. Without that, 
intimate revolt wouldn't be possible at all. I stop here, otherwise I go on too long. Uh, thank you all very much for listening.